You guys ready for the word of the Lord today? Are you? Hey, thanks, man. Well, we are uh, finishing up a series we've been in called How's Your Soul? So you have one more chance to ask that of a semi-stranger sitting next to you, awkward moment, lean to somebody and just say, how's your soul? <laughs> Such a personal question. Several people are like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> the question we're asking in this series is really this. How are you doing on the inside? How are you doing on the inside? The very center of your being. Are you healthy? Are you broken? Do you need some rest? And the premise, the foundation of this series is based on an invitation that Jesus gave in the book of Matthew. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest, and you will find rest for your soul. Because, you know, you can, you can look good on the outside, right? You can be going to the gym five days a week and running five miles and eating the kale and going to the spa treatments three times a week and have all the fashion and be sick on the inside. Be broken, be depressed, even suicidal, even lost for eternity on the inside while the exterior looks good. So Jesus wants us to prosper and be in good health, 3 John 1, 2, even as our soul prospers. And there's a promise here in uh, Jeremiah. God says, um, if you return to me, I will restore you that you may serve me. Listen in. Restoration is a biblical concept, and restore means to return to its original state or function or purpose. I had a 55 Chevy back in the day that I fully restored, and one of the great regrets of my life <laughs> is that I sold it very cheap back when I needed some money. But to restore something means God takes your life and brings it back to its original purpose and intent. We all know John 10.10 10 that says the thief, the adversary, the enemy comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Has anybody experienced some of that in your life? Come on. You had some stuff ripped off, some potential destroyed. But then Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full. He is a restorer. So when we return to the Lord, which is not just a one-time act of repentance, to repent means to change my mind followed by a change of direction. So whenever I turn to the Lord, he refreshes and he restores uh, Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. My observation and, and my burden today for bringing this particular message is this. I see people come in and out of church and they look good and they look like Christians and they probably are. But on the inside, when you start having the conversation, they have a wounded soul. They have a broken spirit. There was a tragedy in life they never got healed up from. There was something that happened to them, a betrayal, a decision that marked and scarred them, and they're carrying those wounds. And I want to ask the question, how are you doing on the inside? Maybe you're whole on the outside. Are you broken internally? Do you still need some healing? How many of you guys know that pastors like to ask questions at church? You see how I put that in question form? How many of you are uncomfortable with the pastor asking you questions at church? You know, you go to church and they have you turn and say things to people next to you, which can be weird. You know, I like to do it up here because I want interaction and I want you to get what we're saying. And there is a dynamic when you speak something out that it gets in your brain, your heart, your memory much better than just receiving it audibly. And so we have you say things. But when I visit churches on vacation or I'm in Southern Cal and I go to a church, I don't know anybody and I'm just, I'm incognito, I'm laying low, you know, I'm flip-flops and sunglasses, back row kind of guy, just you know, like you. And... Um, <laughs> I'm just chilling, wanting to come to church. And the pastor says, turn to your neighbor and say, wah, 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 wah. And this is something to me. He goes, I don't want to do that. <laughs> How many of you believe or have you sensed? Is anybody in the room? And, and don't lift your hand unless you sense this. There is a momentum. There is a move of the Holy Spirit at a, a fresh level happening right now in our church. All right? So we, we love to ask questions at church. But here's the kind of questions we don't ask. And please, at all locations, do not lift your hand on these. But answer them internally. How many of you were physically abused growing up? How many of you have been sexually abused? How many have had or walked someone through an abortion and it left a brokenness in your soul? How many of you are addicted to pornography and it is breaking you on the inside? How many have gone through a painful divorce and your soul is yet to heal from it? Those are the real questions. Now, even mentioning those out and asking those questions, it does something to the atmosphere of the room. 
Because many of us here and looking in have experienced some of those things and betrayal and someone committed adultery and a, a church blew up and we were betrayed or we were abused physically or sexually as a child. And it's something we, we bury inside. Perhaps we've dealt with it. Perhaps we haven't. But I want to tell you something today. There is a redeemer who does not only want to save your spirit and regenerate you eternally, he wants to restore your soul. He wants to reach down and take his healing oil and minister to the brokenness of your life. God does, is not satisfied with your name being written in the Lamb's book of life and you're called a son or daughter while you live with brokenness and below your potential. He wants to heal our souls, amen? So tucked in the history of Jerusalem and the kingdom of Israel and the reign of David is a very unique story, and I want to unpack this 3,000-year-old story for just a few minutes and give you some New Testament application. Today, I want to talk about a, a little-known character in the Old Testament by the name of Mephibosheth. Anybody ever heard of him? Mephibosheth. Can we say it together? Mephibosheth. Now... Uh, I, I was looking on the record on this. I, I've spoken this particular message at conferences in other churches, and I spoke it here, I think, about five to six years ago. Was anybody here when I talked about Mephibosheth, and you remember it? Okay, effective. Today will be better. <laughs> the reason I want to talk about this guy is I think there's some application to the healing of our brokenness that God wants to bring us. So uh, this, this portion of Scripture I'm going to read first, it's actually in parentheses in most translations. So we're actually going along with another narrative in uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel. And then all of a sudden kind of takes a, a right, and the writer says this right here. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him, and he became crippled in both feet. What a sad story. This adorable little five-year-old boy. You know, it would not be uncommon for an incoming king of a nation to destroy the families of the previous king, especially if there was an heir apparent. It was done consistently throughout history. And so maybe she was afraid that the new king, David, and his regime would come and eliminate all of the offspring of Jonathan, who was the rightful heir to the throne of Jerusalem. Or maybe she was running from the Philistine armies. But either way, there was terror when the word came that granddad Saul and father Jonathan of Mephibosheth had been killed in battle. So she scoops up the nanny, the caretaker, scoops up this precious little five-year-old boy, starts sprinting through the palace. We don't have details. Maybe she tripped on the granite steps. Something tragic happened at such a level that this little boy was crippled in both feet for the rest of his life. Now, fast forward from this tragic moment, about 20 years later, um, David is now the king of Israel, and one day he is out on his palace veranda. Jerusalem is the most prosperous city in the world. The nation is thriving. The armies are stronger than they've ever been. There is prosperity and grace, and it is the beautiful city. It's one of the wonders of the world, and he's standing out looking over his empire, and he remembers something. He remembered that 20 years previously, from this moment he's standing in, he made a covenant with his close friend, Jonathan. You see, Jonathan was the rightful heir to the throne, son of Saul. And Jonathan told David, he said, David, you will be king of Israel and I will stand by your side. I'll do whatever I can to make sure you enter your call and you are the king of Israel. And so David makes this covenant with Jonathan. He says, all right then, I'm going to take care of your family as long as I live and as long as any of your family lives. And he forgets about that covenant for 20 years. But on this day, he remembers it. So let's pick up the story here in chapter 9. He says, one day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive, anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked, in Lodabar, 
Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Amiel. So David went from him and brought him from Machir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, at your service. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. And I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such a kindness to a dead dog like me? There's a lot in that statement we won't unpack, but just a little bit of a glimpse of the way that he viewed himself. Then the king summoned Saul's servant, Ziba, and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. This is an amazing story, and it really reveals the heart of God. It really reveals who Jesus is in the New Testament. And there's a few application points and considerations that I want to give you from this 3,000-year-old story. The first one is this, that Mephibosheth was a victim. He was a victim. His brokenness was the result of his grandfather's sin. There was something in his genetics. And some of you in the room, you had a wicked grandfather or a wicked uncle or an alcoholic dad or you saw your parents go through divorce or you grew up with addiction in your home. Pornography was all over the place. You grew up, you were set up for failure and some of the things you've experienced in your life, they truly were not your fault. Now, that doesn't mean we can blame everybody for our future because really the question is, not what happened to us in the past, but how will I respond to the invitation to move forward from the hurts and the brokenness of my past? See, we cannot change what happened to us, but we don't have to live where brokenness left us. Listen closely. You don't have to live where brokenness left you. You don't have to live where the genetics or the hereditary brokenness, sin, and failure of your family, the path that they have laid out. You know, last night we had an awesome service, and there was a young man that was in that tank. It was one of the most powerful testimonies I've heard, and he began to talk about how his family was broken, and he'd done some time in prison, and he talked about just a little bit, all in 90 seconds, but he made this statement, I will not continue on that path. It stops here, and by God's grace, I'm going to build a godly legacy. I'm just telling you, you don't have to live where brokenness left you. Where did, where did brokenness leave Mephibosheth? He came from a place called Lodabar, which means a wasteland. It means a place without pasture. There's no food there. It's barren. And then the very root of Mephibosheth's name means this, to be disappointed, to experience delay, and to be ashamed. So here is an individual who's disappointed, he's experienced delay, and he's ashamed, living in a place of barrenness. And into that place, listen, into that place, the king sends a message. Such a type of Jesus. He says, I'm calling you up. I know it wasn't your fault. I know you're living in a barren place. I know you've experienced some hurt and pain. Life has dropped you, but there is a message from the king, and he's come to call you up to a brand new reality, a brand new future. This is a picture of Jesus, the king saying, I want to heal you. I want to restore your life. The second observation I want to make is Mephibosheth was called to the king's palace, and he said it at the table because of a covenant that was made long before he arrived on the scene. You see, about 10 years before this particular event, about five years before Mephibosheth was born, David stood out in the wilderness of En Gedi, and he made that covenant with Jonathan. And so when Mephibosheth was born five years before the accident, there was already a covenant in place. How does that apply to you? Long ago, Ephesians 1 and 4, 
Even before God formed the world, he chose you through what Christ would do. He preordained that you would walk in good gifts. He has a call, a high call for your life. Listen, guys, right there at CMF. Listen, Napa Campus in East Bay. God has called and ordained great things for you long before you looked at his direction. He had written your name on the palm of his hand. He said, I have plans for you for greatness. He made a covenant regardless of your response. And he said, I, I've got something laid out. And I'm, at some point in your journey, a message is going to come from the king. And you get to walk into that covenant. Here's a verse that's too good to pass up. First Chronicles says, God remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for how long? A thousand generations which you don't have to do the math on that. It just means this, his covenant never ends. Now, when we're faithless, he's faithful. When we forget the laws of God, his law remains. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word shall never pass away. And when he makes a covenant with you, and what covenant are you living by? You are living by a new covenant. You're living by the blood of the, the spotless lamb that was shed. And Jesus stood at the Last Supper, and he said, this is the new covenant written in my blood, which means you have access to the king, you have access to the palace, you don't have to live in your barrenness, because God remembers his covenant even on days when you forget about it. It still applies to your life. Preaching better than you're responding, but I will press on in faith. Here's another reality. The inheritance was far greater than what... Mephibosheth could imagine. Think about this. He's sitting in a barren place. He's 25 years old now. He's been crippled since kindergarten. And he's ashamed. He can't worship in the temple because of his brokenness. Um, most people in his condition would beg for alms on the street. And he gets a knock on the door. And it's Ziba. It's the servant of Saul representing King David in downtown Jerusalem. And he gets called up. And not only does he go before the king to be reinstated and have a place at the table, but David says this. He's talking to Ziba. He said, I've given your master's grandson, so Saul's grandson, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. How much was Saul worth? You cannot even calculate it. He was a billionaire. He owned large portions of land and wealth, and there was inheritance. And God said this, all of that, I'm giving to this broken individual. You know, the word of God says about you that no eye has seen, no ear has heard. It hasn't even entered the heart or the imagination of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And that's not talking about pie in the sky and a sweet by and by. Although there is an, uh, an eternal inheritance, he's talking about the provision for this life, relationships and ministry and financial prosperity. I'm telling you, when you accept the invitation, when you sit at the table, there is a covenant keeping God that wants to bless you. And that covenant comes all the way from Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, when God says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Just elbow your neighbor, say, he's talking about you. Just elbow your neighbor. Do that thing you hate to do. Talk to somebody in church. <laughs> yes, you are the recipients of this inheritance in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now, so Ziba and the servants, they take Mephibosheth from Lodabar, and they take the trip to downtown Jerusalem, and they head up to Mount Zion, the city of the great king. So here is the, um, here's the dinner scene. It's Friday night, Mount Zion, King David comes in with his entourage, sits down, the servants begin to line up, they're right there, the dining hall in the palace, it's the best of food, the best of wine, the best of everything, and as David gathers in all of his sons and daughters and family, they begin to come in. First, there's, there's Amnon, he's the oldest son. He's well-respected, he's, he's a dignitary, he's a ruler in Jerusalem, and Amnon sits down to David's right, and his beautiful wife sits next to him. And then, coming in the other door, here comes Tamar. Anybody ever heard of Tamar? She, she's one of, I think, two women in the Bible that the scripture, the canon of scripture says, and she was very beautiful. Heads up, 
when the can of scripture says you're very beautiful, you're fine. <laughs> you're doing just right. You're a head turner for sure. Tamar, Amnon. And then the, the, the uh, study door cracks open. Solomon comes out, right? Because he's been writing Proverbs as he does. And Solomon sits down. And next to Solomon, he has a few of his wives. He has quite a collection. Of this, so they come to dinner on a rotation. Old Testament, another story, another sermon. And Solomon sits down, and his wives are beautiful. They're gorgeous. And, and then uh, they hear a, a chariot, a loud chariot outside, of course. It's Absalom. And he's got a stereo blare and his subwoofer's rocking. And he's probably got spinners on his chariot because that was back in the day when they still had those. He comes rumbling up and he walks in with his girlfriend, flipping his long black hair around. He's way too cool. And David greets him, Solomon, oh, excuse me, Absalom, my son, to which he replies, sup. <laughs> he sits down. And then there's Joab. Joab is the nephew of King David, the commander and the chief of all the armies of Israel. And this guy is ripped. He comes in probably in a tank top, tan, sleeve tats. He's muscle magazine status. He's like, what? Give me the beef. Pass the filet. You know, that guy. You guys getting a picture? This is the palace crowd. This, these are the best of the best. These are the elite. They've been genetically preferred. They've been handed down the best of the best for generations. I, I mean, in our society, these would be um, those that spend a lot of time at the spa and they shop all the right fashion. They're the Armani and the Versace and the Gucci and, and all that. Jimmy Choo sandals and coach purses. The lipo, the lifted, the Botox, the implanted. Those that lack for nothing, the palace crowd, they belong here. They're the people that everybody else wants to be or be with. And they're getting ready for dinner, and then they, they hear a commotion in the hallway. And they're like, what is that? That sounds different. There's some ruffling around going on. And the curtain opens up. And through the curtain, there's two guards carrying a 25-year-old man who's crippled in both feet. And they think, oh. Wait, wait, wait. We don't, we don't have lame people in the palace? They're not even allowed here. No lame people are even allowed to worship in the temple mount, much less sit at the table of the king of Israel. And they bring in Mephibosheth. And King David says, hey, uh, Solomon, why don't you scoot down one seat? And Tamar, why don't you sit over there? And Mephibosheth, come, sit. And they pull up this crippled son, and they put his feet underneath the table. And David said, you will always eat here. This is your place now. That is such a picture of Jesus. It's such a picture of his church. And it's such a picture of your life. And I want to ask you this. Have you received that invitation to come and bring your brokenness? That's the first application point, by the way. You got to receive the invitation. You know, there are people that come to church that think, I really can't get involved. I can't be a part of that group until I got to get all healed up. I got to cuss less and give more and get off this addiction and, you know, learn some scripture. And I got to do some things first before I can get there. And I got some issues to work out. No, 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 no. Your king says, bring your brokenness and bring it right underneath the table. You belong with all your brokenness. There's a place for you. See, healing is found at the table. The table represents the word of God, the wine of his spirit, the welcome of the Father, a place where you can thrive. It is the table of the Lord, but you got to receive that invitation. And as you sit there, you realize, man, I didn't think I belonged at first, but I'm starting to feel like this is home. I wonder if Mephibosheth felt a bit awkward the first few dinners with all the palace crowd. But I think something happened, speculation. They probably started listening to his stories, enjoyed his humor. And within a few weeks or months, he just felt like one of the family because he always ate at the table of the king. So we have to receive this invitation. Let me ask you a personal question. Have you brought your brokenness to God's table? Have you received the invitation? Second application point today is this. You got to make God's table your place of permanence. In other words, don't run off. D don't, 
Don't run from the very source that will heal your soul, the wounds of your past. Make it a place of permanence. Declare that his house is my house. I don't know how you relate to this. I shared a very personal story last night, but man, my life, I relate to this message and it always gets me in an emotional place because I was 16 and my mom gave me a heads up that I had some pretty severe physical deformities when I was born, which I knew nothing about. So I was like, thanks mom for that boost for my self-esteem. I really, <laughs> information I didn't need. She told me that when I was born, that both my feet were severely deformed. The doctors didn't expect me to ever walk or walk properly. And I said, well, exactly what happened? She said, well, actually, one of your feet was going sideways. The other one was actually going backwards. So if you ever wonder why Pastor Dave's going in four directions. <laughs> All right, enough. <laughs> this is a true story, by the way. So back in the day, before medicine really evolved, when I was born... Uh, the first few months of my life, I spent going through intentional breaking of bones and resetting my legs. And I spent the few, first few months of my life in a, uh, a lower cast in the bottom half of my body. So when I learned about that and then read about Mephibosheth, I'm like, okay, I get it. But I don't remember it. I mean, and I run like a gazelle now, so it's all good. I feel great. I can jump high. And, you know, God, God restored that. So there were some miracles. Had a praying mom for sure. But, you know, life has dropped me. And I could tell you a lot of stories about being in the home of a pastor who had multiple affairs. And my parents went through a divorce and public shame and serving with pastors that stepped down. A good friend I served with had a secret lifestyle and ended up dying of AIDS and did his funeral and betrayal. I've seen some stuff in life. In other words, life has dropped me on the head a few times. How about you? But the reason I serve the king and the reason I stay at the table is I don't identify with being dropped. I don't identify with my handicap. And a lot of you still do. There's people there. You're still blaming uncle. You're still blaming the ex. You're still blaming the church. Still blaming that pastor that failed you. And yes, he did fail you. And yeah, the ex was an idiot. I don't know them, but they probably were. But that's not the issue here. The issue is there is an invitation from a king for you to sit permanently at a table and be healed and never again relate to the brokenness of your past. You relate to the health and the prosperity that is in Christ Jesus for your future. That's how I live. I'm not what my genetics and my granddad and the pain of my junior high years and all the failure of my past says I am. I am who the king says that I am. I got a place at the table. I'm a son of the most high God. I'm a king and a priest. I am healed in Jesus' name. Why? Because I have made a decision that I ain't leaving the table. I'm at this, this is my seat. Hey, Tamar, you find another seat. Solomon, sit down at the end. This is Mephibos' seat right here. Are you seated at a table? Are you planted in the house of God? Have you said, I will feed from the word. I will be in fellowship with the community of believers. And I will follow Jesus all the days of my life. That's how you get your soul healed. That's how you get healed from brokenness. And the last thing I'll pray for you guys. Bring someone to the table who can't bring themselves. You know there's someone in your family that's broken and they won't bring themselves. There's somebody at your workplace that they won't come to church unless they're carried. They're invited. What if this chair that the scripture is talking about, one of two things. First we sit in ours and then we pull one out for someone else. The reason that I read this 3,000-year-old story is Jesus is the head of the table. We don't know if Mephibosheth ever got healed in this lifetime. We don't know that. There's indication he probably stayed crippled for the rest of his days. But at this table, there was a promise of one day complete and total healing. And yes, there were miraculous healings in the Old Testament. But think about this. Final thought. King David is sitting at the head of the table in this palace who is only a type and a prophetic picture of one who would sit upon the throne of David. And his name would be the son of David. And when the son of David came, he began to heal all who were broken 
And John the Baptist was thrown in prison and he sends his disciples and he says, Ask this Jesus of Nazareth, my cousin, is he the one or should we look for another? And Jesus sends back John's disciples and said, Tell John this, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, and the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. I'm telling you, Jesus is the one. So I'm asking you to sit in the chair, and then I'm asking you to be Zeba in someone's life. Who is it? One, one final thought. Who is it in your life that needs a knock on the door and for you to say, listen, the king has need of you. There's an invitation for you to sit at the table because all who are thirsty, whosoever will, come. You will find rest for your soul. Amen.